Well, what a great day we've had. Amen? It's been a good day today. We praise the Lord for that. I want you to take your Bibles tonight. We're going to go back to John 19 one more time uh, for tonight. And then we're going back there again probably here in the next little bit. And I want to talk to you. I, I Listen, I'm going to teach to, to you tonight. I'm not going to preach to you. And I feel good. I feel good tonight. But my, my voice is in bad shape tonight. And so I'm just going to I'm just going to teach this evening. But I'm just looking over, I'm just looking over this outline while the singing's going on. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, there's so much important stuff in here I need to give the church. And so I'm just going to teach it to you. I hope you're hungry for the word of God tonight. And we'll just get it, you'll get it in teaching format tonight. But let's look at it tonight. John chapter 19 in your Bibles. And when you find your place, let's stand tonight. We won't read as much as we did this morning. We'll just read the first 11 verses. And then we'll jump into this Bible study. We're going to use our Bibles a lot tonight. And so get your Bibles ready to roll and uh, ready to turn. John 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Now look at verse 11. It's our text. The Bible says in verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Notice the last line. Therefore... He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, that last little part. He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. I was reading that the other day, and I came across that, that verse, and it never really uh, stood out to me like it did that day. And I began to think about that, the greater sin. What does that mean, the greater sin? Are there some sins that are greater? And so because of that, I want to talk to you about this subject tonight. Are some sins worse than others? And so I'm going to try to answer that for you tonight. By the way, I believe that there are. And, uh, and I, I believe I'll show you which sin is worse than others. You may be seated tonight. And I promise you this is going to be a Bible study. So get ready to... Uh, sort of dig in a little bit, and, and we're going to get in our Bibles this evening. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and thank you. What a wonderful song service. Wonderful. Thank you for the great choir music, singing. God, thank you for the, the musicians and the way they've used their gifts tonight. Thank you for the wonderful congregational singing. And then, Lord, thank you for that beautiful special, Lord, that Brother Raphael just brought us concerning the grace of God. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll knit our hearts together as we learn something from your precious book tonight. Lord, you know, whenever I get to this point, I'm always nervous. I'm a little nervous, and I am tonight, and especially when my voice is not 100%. But, Spirit of God, I pray that you'll bring the increase. I know you're able to do that. You can work in spite of me, and you do, often do. And so I pray that you do that tonight. And I pray that we would receive truth, and I pray because we receive truth, that we would be more like Jesus. And God, I pray that we would leave this place tonight being able to say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. The best that we know how we plead the blood that we've sang about tonight. We plead the blood of Jesus over this service. And God, we pray that you might bind the powers of darkness. And I pray, Lord, that you would accomplish your perfect will tonight in every heart, including mine. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. And we yield to your Holy Spirit now. Please teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen. You know, all my life, and I, I, I've got a feeling I'm probably like, like you, all my life growing up, I believed that all sin was the same. I've heard that. There are no big sins. There are no little sins. 
In God's eyes, all sin is the same. I've heard that taught. I'm going to be honest with you. I've taught that myself. And yet in this passage in John, John chapter 19 that we read tonight, Jesus makes mention of the greater sin. Look back at it again, if you will. John chapter 19, verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. It's the Greek word miazon, and it means larger or stronger. So you could sort of say it like this. Um, he that delivered me unto thee hath the larger sin or hath the stronger sin. On the flip side of that, there are some churches who teach the exact opposite of what I just said. They teach that there are some really big, big sins, and then there are some sins that are not big at all. They're just sort of small sins. I'm definitely, definitely not picking, not trying to anyway, pick on the Catholic Church today. We taught this morning in our Sunday school class, um, uh, can only God forgive sins? And I mentioned some things, by the way, right off, the, they're not a secret, they're, it's not slander, you can just go on the Catholic website and you read it yourself. And, uh, and uh, let me give you something else the Catholic Church believes. The Roman Catholic Church promotes the concepts of what they call mortal sins and venial sins. Mortal sins results in the spiritual death of the soul. Uh, they're intentional and grave sins, such as murder, adultery, and fornication. If a person dies with a mortal sin on his soul, he's lost forever. The remedy for a mortal sin, at least this is what the Catholic Church says, the remedy for a mortal sin is the sacrament of penance, which brings a person back into the relationship with God. A venial sin is a lesser sin or a forgivable sin that does not break fellowship with God or result in the soul being eternally separated from the Lord. And so, in other words, there are some sins that are just really, really serious. There are some sins that are really big, and there are other sins that are no big deal, and you don't have to worry about them very much. But here's what I'm interested in. What does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach? I'm not really interested in a religion. I'm not really interested in a, in a website. Uh, I want to know what the Bible has to say. And that's where we're going to go tonight. So by way of introduction, let me start by saying this. All sin is great. All sin is great. Uh, every sin is great. Every sin is bad. Every sin is large. All sin is great. You say, well, uh, Pastor, why is that? And this is the reason. Because every single sin must be paid for. It must be paid for. And so sin is why Jesus chose to offer his life a ransom. Thank you, brother. I sure appreciate that. Now, again, I want you to understand something. Murder, Jesus had to come and die for the murderer. But if you've never murdered and you just told a white lie, Jesus still had to come and die for that white lie. Every single sin must be paid for. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Again, let's just get this part straight first, that every single sin is great. Now, think about it just a moment. Consider Eve's sin. Consider Eve's sin. Eve was never unfaithful to Adam. We, we don't have any record of that. That she cheated on Adam. By the way, hard to cheat on somebody when they're already cheated on you. Amen? And so uh, we don't have any record that uh, Eve ever committed adultery or anything like that. She wasn't abusive to her children. We have uh, nothing that leads us to believe that. She didn't claim to the like of drugs and alcohol and, uh, and addiction. Uh, Eve simply ate a piece of forbidden fruit. That's what she did. She ate a piece of fruit. Now, it's forbidden, but she ate a piece of forbidden fruit. By the way, also, that doesn't seem all that bad. And yet, that very sin plunged mankind into a state of sinfulness and brought us death. And so, all sin is great. So, here's the thing. You can get any one of that kind of a message tonight and understand that. All sin is great. But you know what's a dangerous position to take? When you begin believing your sin is not as bad as the sin of another. If 
my daughter could take a bite and have a full tub of Brenda, let me crack the first hint, Brenda. Let me crack the first hint. And we'll just look quick at, at verse number one. There are some who say, well, you know what, preacher? Maybe I'm not what I need to be, but at least my sin is not as bad as that other person. Well, uh, that's not a scriptural stance. Look what our Bible says. And by the way, can I just remind us this is the Lord that's giving us this truth right here. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And look at verse number 1. The Bible says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. What in the world does that mean? I'll, I'll explain it here in just a moment. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things, I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them? Think ye that they were sinners among all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Interesting uh, passage here that we just read. Evidently, there were some Jews that even while they were involved in the sacrifice, the worship of sacrifice, Rome, while they were doing the sacrifice, Rome came in and killed these, these uh, uh, saints that were sacrificing, and their blood was mingled with the sacrifice. That's what it's talking about. And uh, uh, and then there's no really no, no information that's given about the Tower of Siloam that fell. But this is what Jewish custom taught back in this day, that if you died in a very unconventional way, like these Christians did, if you died in a very unconventional way, you were probably guilty of some gross sin, some gross immorality. In other words, if a tower fell on you, well, you probably did something really, really bad. And so these that were in the temple, and they were sacrificing, and for some reason Rome came in and uh, invaded the temple and killed these Christians, and their blood was mingled with the sacrifice. Uh, the Jewish people said, well, those people must have been really, really bad because they died like they died. And so anytime something really bad happened to you, you must be a terrible, terrible, wicked, wicked sinner. Remember this in the book of Job? When the Bible says a tornado or a wind hit Job's kids' houses and it killed all ten of Job's kids. Remember when his friends, friends, there's friends like those, you don't need enemies. But when his friends came in to encourage him, remember what they said? Job, you're a wicked sinner. And Job, evidently your kids were really, really bad for something like that to happen. What, what, what's that about? Because they believe that if you died in some unconventional fashion, that evidently you were a bad, wicked, immoral sinner. And Jesus came, and this is what Jesus is saying. I want you to understand that all sin is great. All sin is great. So let's get that down first. But the question still remains, are there some sins that are worse than others? So I'm going to give you, I think, four statements, four or five statements tonight, and we'll be headed to the house. Number one, and this is not an alliterated outline. I'm just going to give you some statements. Number one, the Bible does seem to insinuate that some sin is greater in scope than others. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and look at verse number 20. All sin is great. All sin had to be paid for. But the Bible does seem to teach that some sin is greater in scope than others. Matthew 11, and look at verse number 20. The Bible says, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe, look what the Lord Jesus says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Look at verse 22. Interesting verse 22. Jesus said, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Verse 24. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. In other words, the, the sin that you committed is a 
a, a heinous sin. It's a terrible sin. In fact, listen, man, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the end than it is for you. Now, you're in the book of Matthew. Turn back a page or two. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And look at verse number 1. The Bible does seem to insinuate that there are some sins that are greater in scope than others. Matthew 7 and verse number 1. The Bible says, look what the Lord says. Again, this is our Lord. He says, judge not that ye be not judged. For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured you again. Look at verse 3. And why beholdest thou the, what's the word? Why beholdest thou the mote? That's a speck. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. In other words, the Lord Jesus is saying this, why are you concerned with this thing that your brother is doing when you're doing something far greater, when you're doing something worse? It's what the Lord is saying. Man, don't be concerned about their little sin when you've got worse sin in your life than they've got. And so the Bible does seem to insinuate that there are some sins that are greater in scope. But this is where I want to get to. I want you to go back to John 19 again. John 19. And this is what I want to talk to you about just for a few moments tonight. I believe this with all of my heart, what I'm getting ready to tell you. You say, preacher, the greater sin. Look what he says. John 19, verse 11. This is where we'll stay. As far as this thought, this is where we'll stay. John 19, verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Look at the last line. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. What is the greater sin? And I believe this is the answer. The greater sin is deliberate. The greater sin is deliberate sin. Now, uh, listen, listen to that statement again. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee. This is Jesus talking to Pilate. Pilate, the man that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. That statement almost has to be a reference either to Caiaphas or Judas. So, so think about this. Think about this. Pilate was definitely sinful. But Jesus ins- insinuating there was a greater sin. Now, Pilate was a Roman. Pilate had not been exposed to the teachings in the synagogue. Pilate was more than likely polytheistic in his, in his belief. He probably thought there were many gods, many gods. He had not been in close contact with the Savior. And so, yes, was Pilate wrong for crucifying the Lord Jesus? Absolutely, he was wrong. He executed an innocent man. And yet, Pilate, the Lord Jesus Christ insinuated, Pilate, what you're doing is wrong. But there's somebody that's done more wrong than you. Again, this had to be almost a reference to Judas. What are you talking about, preacher? Think with me, and and we won't be long. What Judas did was willful and absolutely deliberate. Do you understand? Pilate, although Pilate did wrong, Pilate was a pagan. You understand that? Pilate was a heathen. Pilate was a man that grew up believing in, in Zeus and Apollos and, uh, and Aphrodite and all these, uh, maybe even thousands and hundreds of gods. Uh, and yet Judas was a man that knew better. Judas was a man that walked with Jesus. Judas was a man that witnessed the miracles of Jesus. Judas was a man that heard the teaching of Jesus. Judas was a man that experienced the love and the mercy of Christ. And yet our Bible says that he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. It was deliberate sin. And I believe this, that deliberate sin is the greatest sin. We know it's wrong, and yet we deliberately commit the sin. It's the greater sin. Now, let me show you a thought. Again, as the Bible says. I want you to turn over to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, and look at verse number 2. Deliberate sin. Again, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna dig a little further, so hang in there with me. Let me show you a contrast to deliberate sin. 
2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, talks about a man by the name of Uzzah, or Uzzah, however you want to say it, Uzzah. And uh, look at the story, if you will, 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 2. The Bible says, that, And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from this the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubim. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, watch closely, the Bible says Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his, what's the word? For his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now, let me tell you what happened or what's going on here. You weren't allowed to touch the ark of the covenant. God purposely put poles. He put rings on the corners, poles to those rings, and the priests were to carry those, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, on their shoulders. They were to, to bear it, not put it on an ark, not put it on a cart. And uh, David decided, you know what, we're going to do things a worldly way like the uh, Philistines did. And they put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. Now, they put it on a new cart, but they put it on a cart, and it's being pulled by oxen. And uh, they're on their way to put it back where it's supposed to go, and yet they hit a ditch or a pothole. And the Bible says the oxen shook it, and the Ark of the Covenant sort of shifted on the cart. And Uzzah, uh, just doing probably what you and I would have done, uh, Uzzah saw the Ark of the Covenant sort of move, and he's not even thinking about it. He reached up to steady the Ark, and God killed him instantly. You know why? Because he didn't touch the Ark. It's a symbol of the presence of God. And God killed him. Now, isn't it interesting that the Bible says that God smote him for his error. In fact, the Holy Spirit doesn't even reference what Uzzah did or Uzzah did as sin, but rather an error. Now, Uzzah's actions are reminders that all sin comes with a penalty. All sin comes with a penalty. But Uzzah's sin was not a deliberate sin. You just don't go on that. Uzzah didn't get up that day and say, you know what, I'm going to touch the Ark of the Covenant. I don't believe that happened at all. I believe probably Uzzah was a good man. I believe he was probably an honorable man. And uh, he, he didn't mean to. Uh, he just wasn't thinking. And when the Ark of the Covenant shifted, he went to set it. And when he did, God took his life. And so the greater sin is deliberate sin. Now stay with me. Good teaching or bad? Uh, th th listen, good preaching, no. But I promise you, I'm going to give you some stuff here that's going to help you here. The greater sin is deliberate sin. Number three. Deliberate sin comes with greater punishment. Deliberate sin comes with greater punishment. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12. We're not going to be long. We're going to be very thorough. I want you to hang in there with me. Luke chapter 12, look at verse number 47. Wow, this is something. Luke 12, verse 47. If you found your place, say amen. All right, good. You're there. Luke 12, verse 47. And that servant, look at the next line, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with, what's it say? Many stripes. Look at verse 48. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with what? With few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Uh, and that servant which knew his Lord's will. He knew his Lord's will, and yet he did the opposite. You know what that is? That's deliberate sin. 
And the Lord said, when you, when you commit deliberate sin, you know better, you know you shouldn't do it. Listen, there's no question. You don't have to pray. You don't have to seek counsel. The Spirit of God's already revealed it to you. You know it's wrong. You know you shouldn't do that thing. And yet, you just deliberately, you deliberately do it. You know what the Bible says? That that comes with greater punishment. Now, I thought about this. There's going to be a lot of Christian kids that are going to have to answer to God one day for deliberate sin because they were brought up right and they made a conscious choice to turn away from right. Am I preaching it straight tonight? Oh, yeah. And you know what? We can make excuses all day long and say, well, you know what? You don't know my mom and dad. My mom, was, mom and dad were strict, and I'm sure that your mom and dad were strict, and, and you can say they were too strict or whatever you want to say. But you know what? I'm just saying there's a lot of, lot of kids in America that came up in Christian homes, and mom and dad at least, uh, they weren't perfect, weren't perfect in any way, but mom and dad tried to read the Bible, and they tried to take them to church, and they tried to be faithful, and they, they, they tried to teach them morality, and they tried to show them what was right, and they tried to teach them how to be honest and they try to teach them how to be faithful to God and uh, uh, and, and you know what here's some kids and they had good parents and those parents taught them how, how to serve the Lord and now those kids have turned away from the things of the Lord I'm telling you brother one of these days they're going to stand before a holy God and they're going to answer harder because they know what is right and yet they deliberately turned away from it and I thought about this. There's going to be many a church member who will have to answer to God for deliberate sin because they attended a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Friend, they've heard the truth. They know what truth is. Man, they've heard this book preached and taught from cover to cover, and they know what's right. The Spirit of God has spoken to their heart. They know what is right. They know what is true. They know what is real. And yet, many of those church members have turned away from the things of the Lord, and they're walking far from God. And this is all I'm saying. Did you know there's coming a day when those people will answer more because of their deliberate sin than others who don't know? And so the greater sin, I believe, is deliberate sin. Deliberate sin comes with greater punishment. We're almost done. The fiercest judgment, number four, the fiercest judgment belongs to those who have been exposed to truth, but deliberately, deliberately turn away. Now, I'm, I'm almost done. The wheels are almost on the runway. Did you know there are some folks who commit sin but they do it unknowingly. They do it ignorantly. Now, you say, preacher, what about the Holy Spirit? You're right about that. We do have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit not only convicts you, I believe the Holy Spirit convicts the world. And so, yes, I believe there is a Holy Spirit. And I believe he's convicting. I believe he is uh, uh, working in our heart concerning righteousness and temperance and judgment and all those things. But you understand that there are some people, even people that are coming to this church that uh, were never brought up in a Christian home. Uh, they never had a Bible, never had a mom and dad that had devotions. I mean, they, uh, they're not used to what you're used to. Uh, they, they, they came up like that. Uh, and some of those people that sin ignorantly and unknowingly, did you know that God is not going to judge them as severely as people who commit sin and they absolutely know it's wrong? In fact, let me show you something that maybe you've noticed and maybe you haven't. Turn over to Acts chapter 17 in your Bibles. Acts chapter 17. If you're still with me, say Amen. All right, I know we're, getting, we're, we're going a little deep tonight. We're going out past the, the little shallow area tonight, all right? So you're going to have to hang in there with me this evening. I tread water with me. Acts chapter 17, and look at verse number 29. Wow, what, a, what an interesting passage here. Acts 17, verse 29. The Bible says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God has likened to gold or silver or stone, now, now watch this. We ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Look at verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. You know what that means, church? 
that when the Bible says God winked at it, there was a time when God sort of shut his eyes to that. Because understand something, they didn't have the complete canon of Scripture like we do today. They didn't have a gospel preacher that preached to them Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And these people, yes, they had gods. They had false gods. They had stone gods. They had wood gods. They had false gods in their home. Uh, and was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. Was it sinful? Yes, it was sinful. Uh, was it ungodly? Yes, it was ungodly. And yet the Bible says that the God of heaven winked. He sort of shut his eyes to that. But look what it says. But now, but now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because we've got God's word on it now. Amen. Amen. We don't have any excuse. And so God is no longer closing his eyes to that. Those that have been exposed to truth and yet still sin, there's going to be greater judgment. Now, again, look, if you will, turn to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. And I want to show you something. And you, and you might think, wow, what in the world? Numbers chapter 15, very interesting story here. And sometimes you read a scripture like this and you think, man, preacher, what in the world? Why was it so severe? Well, uh, let, let me show what I'm talking about. Look at Numbers 15. Look at verse number uh, 32. Numbers 15, verse 32. The Bible says, and... While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. Now, wait a minute. Wait just a cotton-picking minute. This man is not committing murder. He's gathering sticks. Is that what your Bible says? They found a man that gathered sticks. Here's Here's the part, though, upon the Sabbath day. And they found him gathering sticks, uh, and they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in ward. They put him in hold. They put him in jail because it was not declared what should be done to him. So here's a man that's just picking up sticks. He's probably going to build a fire, and uh, he's just gathering wood. You know, it'd be like you going out and splitting kindling, that kind of thing. He's gathering sticks, but he's doing it on the Sabbath day. And, uh, and so some of the people saw that happening. They, they got him. They brought him to Moses. And they put him in jail. They put him in ward because they weren't exactly sure what to do. And look at verse 35. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death. And all the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. Somebody says, wait just a minute. What? The guy's gathering sticks. And and, and did you notice that it wasn't Moses that came to this conclusion? It wasn't the children of Israel that came to this conclusion. It was God. And God came to Moses and put him to death. Put him to death. And somebody says, preacher, what on earth? That doesn't even make sense. It really does make sense. You know why the punishment was so severe? Because it was deliberate sin. It was deliberate. Moses got the children of Israel together and said, this is what God said. The Sabbath is holy. It's what God said. The Sabbath is holy. And on the Sabbath, we're not going to do any work. God's going to give us manna. You won't have to go out and collect it. We're going to collect it a day early. And uh, God's going to take care of all of our needs. We're not going to cook. We're not going to travel. Uh, we're going to stay right where we are. We're going to keep the Sabbath holy. And, uh, and he had taught that and taught that and taught that and taught that. And uh, this is what we're going to do. This is what God says. This is what God says to do. And, uh, and sure as he said that, you know what, what's going on? There's a man out that's just disregarding all that. And he's gathering sticks, gathering sticks, gathering sticks. And somebody says, preacher, what in the world's a big deal about gathering sticks? That's not the problem. The problem is it was absolute deliberate in the face of Almighty God. And God said, kill him. Because it was absolute deliberate sin. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews. And the reason I'm going through this is because I'm going to tell you something. Putting this study together, God really, God really spoke to my heart about this thing. And I hope he speaks to yours as well. Hebrews chapter 10, and look at verse number 26. Hebrews 10, verse 26. 
Look what our New Testament says about this subject. Hebrews 10, verse 26, the Bible says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be he thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now, what's that talking about, preacher? That's talking about absolute, willful, deliberate sin. Now, somebody says, preacher, which is worse? Is adultery worse than fornication? I have no idea. You'll have to talk to God about that. Somebody says, preacher, which is worse? Is uh, robbing a bank worse than uh, kidnapping? I don't know. You'll have to talk about, to God about that. But I can tell you what I believe the Bible's teaching us tonight, that the greater sin, the greater sin is deliberate sin. When you know better, when God has taught you, when the Holy Spirit has exposed you to truth, and yet, in spite of that, you deliberately sin against the Lord. Did you know, this? just on a common sense, just on a common sense basis, did you know in our U.S. judicial system, some of the most severe judgment handed out is given to those who commit crimes willfully and deliberately? In fact, I looked this up. This is from, this is from the U.S. Department of Justice. It's Article 910. You can look it up yourself. Article 910 with the U.S. Department of Justice, and this is what it says. Article 910 is called knowingly and willfully. The term willfully means no more than that the forbidden act was done deliberately and with knowledge and does not require proof of evil intent. McClanahan versus United States, Fifth Circuit Court, 1955. An act is done willfully, if done voluntarily and intentionally, and with the specific intent to do something the law forbids. There's no requirement that the government show evil intent on the part of a defendant in order to prove that the act was done willfully. In other words, if they can prove that you did this thing absolutely deliberately, you're going to get the worst punishment. That's what I'm saying. How many remember the story? How many remember the name Bernie Madoff? Bernie Madoff. Not been that long ago, Bernie Madoff. Uh, let, let me... Let me uh, remind you of Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was a businessman in New York, and uh, he was once the chairman of the NAS NASDAQ Stock Exchange, uh, a businessman. And Bernie Madoff created a Ponzi, a Ponzi scheme to steal more than $20 billion, with a B, $20 billion from investors. Bernie Madoff, by the way, was a Good-looking guy, I guess you'd say, as far as businessmen standards. His suits were not the kind of suits you wear. I'm sure Bernie Madoff did not get his suits from J.C. Penney or Belk. Uh, he definitely didn't get his from uh, Goodwill. Uh, his uh, suits probably cost as much as your car cost. And Bernie Madoff had several houses, some in New York, some in Florida, some in other places. Uh, he was a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. He never committed murder. He never tried to assassinate a sitting president. As far as I know, he never raped anybody. Uh, and yet Bernie Madoff was sentenced to 150 years 150 years. You say, Pastor, was he a serial killer? No. He did not have people buried in his backyard. He didn't murder anybody, never raped anybody. But 150 years they sentenced him to. By the way, he died. Somebody says, Preacher, why did he get so many years? Are you listening to me? Because they proved beyond a shadow of a doubt what Bernie Madoff did was absolutely deliberate. He knew what he was doing. He knew he was scamming those people out of millions. 
And by the way, some believe he was doing it ever since 19, in 1960s. Just scamming, scamming, scamming. $20 billion deliberate. And because of that deliberate sin, he suffered the worst punishment. Now listen to me. I apologize. I wish my voice was better tonight. But I hope you get what I'm teaching this evening. Have you, ever had, have you ever had the Holy Spirit come to you and absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, the Holy Spirit said, you know, that's not what you should do. That's not where you should go. That's not the crowd that you should hang around. That's not something that you should partake of. Oh, I know the world is doing that, but that's not what you should do. That's not what you should drink. That's not the lifestyle that you should live. You should not do that. Now, here's the thing. If we absolutely go against that and God has told us not to do it, you know what that is? That's the greater sin. That's deliberate. It's willful. And when we commit deliberate sin, we can expect the worst punishment. So here's what you say, well, preacher, what do we do? What, what do we do? Here's what we do. We yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Because we're all sinners. We've all got this old nature. We're all struggling. We might as well go ahead and be, we might as well go ahead and be real about that. We're all struggling. Every one of us are. We're all struggling with temptation and sin. And so somebody said, preacher, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to, I, I don't want to commit deliberate sin and have the wrath of God on my life. What do I do? You yield yourself to the Holy Spirit day after day after day after day uh, and hour after hour after hour, and you constantly pray things like this. Lord, give me the mind of Christ. Give me the mind of Christ. Give me the mind of Christ. And when the tempter comes and tries to get you to fall and get you to sin, oh, listen, you stand strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads tonight. Father, we love you. Oh, Lord, I pray somehow that you'll take this simple, simple message. And God, I pray that you'd challenge some other people like you've challenged me. Lord, you know this week I've had to confess some deliberate sin. Lord, there's been some times when, God, I knew I shouldn't be doing things. And yet I find myself doing that. Lord, that's willful. That's deliberate. That's the greater sin. When I know it's wrong, and yet I do it, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And God, forgive us. And Father, I pray tonight that you would give us a church full of people that would be yielded to the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be sanctified, separated from the world. And God, help us to be faithful. And Lord, when temptation comes, when temptation comes, God, help us to stand strong. Help us to be faithful. And Lord, help us to do our best to do the will of God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. It'll be hard to give an invitation after a message like this. But I would just ask you tonight, is there any, is there any thing that the Holy Spirit has pointed to tonight in your heart, your life, deliberate? The Holy Ghost has already came to you and said, listen, that's not for you. Don't you be taking part in anything like that. And yet, you found yourself getting wrapped up in that. If that's the case, whether you do it in your seat or you do it at the altar tonight, would you just go to the Lord right now or here in just a moment and would you say, Lord, forgive me for that deliberate sin. Forgive me, Lord, for committing the greater sin. I know it's not right. I know I ought to quit it. I know I've got to stop it. I know I do. Lord, you've revealed it to me. I've got to stop. I've got to get things right. If that's you tonight, listen, would you do business with the Lord? Let's all stand tonight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And if the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart tonight and there's anything, anything at all that you need to do with the Lord, I would encourage you to.
Maybe just tiptoe down to the altar and do business with God tonight. Would you do that? So, Heavenly Father, have thy way in this invitation. Lord, it could be there may be somebody here tonight that's lost. There could be somebody here tonight, Lord, that doesn't know Christ as Savior. And, Father, I pray tonight would be the night that they'd come to know the Lord. Father, help them to come tonight. We'd love to take the Bible and show them how they can know that they know that they're going to heaven when they die. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help them to come. Give them faith and courage. And I pray they'll come tonight and let us speak to them about the gospel. Lord, please have your way. Oh, God, forgive us. Forgive us for our failings. Lord, when we know we ought to be faithful and yet we don't do it, that's deliberate sin. Father, when you reveal things to us and yet we still take part in it, that's deliberate sin. God, forgive us. Forgive us. Have thy way now in the invitation, Lord, please. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Anybody here tonight need to make a move for the Lord? Anybody? If you're here this evening and you say, Brother Pope, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and going to heaven when I die. Hey, listen, I'm going to make my way to the main floor just for a moment, okay? And if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I don't know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Listen, would you come? We'd love to take the Bible and show you how you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. Will you come? While we wait, just for a moment, you come tonight. My soul and 
You can look up here, church. Let's sing it with Brother Abel tonight. So that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing. Listen to that. Keep the way clear. Let nothing be between. Anybody else need to come tonight before we go? Anybody? All hearts free tonight. We're going we're gonna to baptize before we go this evening. And so I think Brother Brandon, I think he's already ready. And so why don't we pray and thank the Lord for the good service today. Father, we love you. What a great day it's been. Lord, it's always a good day, but it's especially a good day when folks are born again. Thank you for saving today. God, thank you for stirring our hearts Thank you that we can come together. And Father, thank you that we can study the Word of God and learn the Word of God. Father, I pray tonight that you would bring the increase, um, Lord, from this message. And Father, this week, help us to make sure there's nothing, there's nothing between my soul and the Savior. God, have thy way. Help us to be, Lord, help us to be the vessels that you want us to be. And Heavenly Father, we're, we're desperate for your help. And so I pray that you'll fill us with the Spirit of God and help us to walk in your Spirit. And Lord, I sure pray that you'd give us victory. God, we thank you and we praise you for all of your blessings. We sure love you tonight in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to, uh, you can be seated just for a moment. We're going to baptize and then we're going to pray and have you on your way tonight. Amen. Come on down. You're all right. There you go. Amen. Well, it's good to see the baptism water stirred once again. Amen. Amen. That's what it's at right here. Many of you know this young lady here, Margie. She's been coming for a, a while now and uh, has been saved and was looking forward to being baptized. Amen. And uh, so we're excited to baptize her tonight. The water's not cold. Amen. It's warm. If you look at she's she's shivering a little bit. Amen. Well, Margie, have you accepted Jesus as your personal yes. Savior? Amen. Well, upon your public profession of your faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Brandon. And the servant said, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Amen. Let's go get somebody else. Amen. And by the way, little Tatum was supposed to be baptized tonight as well, and uh, he got sick today. And so um, anyway, if all goes well, we'll baptize him next week. And so you pray for, uh, pray for Tatum that the Lord would heal him, and he'll get to feeling better, and we've missed them today. Well, let's all stand. And uh, don't forget, Barnabas Ministry has a meeting tonight. So if you're part of the Barnabas Ministry, if you'll be sure that you... Uh, Take part in that and have a great week. Let me just give you a little something real quick, uh, uh, something the Lord's been laying on my heart. Um, one of the things I know, one of the things that we got to do, um, you know, of course, COVID hit and some of the things that we were doing on a regular basis sort of went out. And one of the things I know that we've got to get started back is our visitation evangelism. And so this coming Wednesday night, Lord willing, we're going to start a series and I'm going to teach, once again, I'm going to teach on how to win a soul to Christ and uh, how to win a soul to Christ. Some of you have been coming to me. You're saying, Preacher, I've got some people that I'm burdened about. But what do you do? How, how do you do it? How do you go about that? So we're going to start right there at first base, and we're going to work our way through it. And by the time we get through, you'll know how to lead somebody to Jesus. We'll, we'll give you the nuts and bolts. And, and, uh, and so anyway, Lord willing, we'll start that this coming Wednesday night. And then we'll be talking to you about uh, uh, putting our visitation evangelism back into the schedule. And I think that'll be a good thing for our church. And we hope that you'll take advantage of that. All right. We love you. Hope you'll go away blessed tonight. Brother Rodney, come on up if you will. And dismiss us in a word of prayer tonight.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the honor and privilege that we've had to be in your house and for your precious word that was taught and preached today and to help us to take your word and apply it to our lives and go out and be better Christians for thee. I thank you for our pastor and Miss Tammy and for this church. I pray that you would put a hedge of protection about us and the dear God, I pray for the health and well-being of our pastor and the Miss Tammy and each one uh, be with uh, be with each one who is sick and afflicted. Dear God, I pray you touch the body and heal them. And uh, dear God, help us to uh, let our light so shine, dear God, that others may see Christ in our lives. Forgive us where we fail thee. And these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.